Hey, welcome back to the show. Uh, once again, uh, just so you know, if you're new to this whole thing, uh, right now I'm doing a series of reading chapters from the macroeconomic MMT version of macro macroeconomics, uh, brought to you by uh, William Mitchell, or also known as Bill Mitchell, L. Randall Ray, Martin Watts, and uh, again, that's my macroeconomics. And if you want to support this show, please do by subscribing, commenting, uh, hitting that thumbs up, uh, also a uh, notification with the click on the bell. And if you want to know more about MMT as a whole, you can go to realprogressive.org uh, and also go to uh, moslereconomics.com and look under mandatory reading. Uh, he has at least seven books on his website that are free to download. You can also look up uh, Stephanie Kelton's uh, Deficit Myth and L. Randall Ray, who is one of the authors of the, uh, the macroeconomic textbook, is coming out in the book. Uh, I'm not really sure what the name is, but you can look it up at some point. Uh, it's coming out, uh, I think, within a month or so. Anyways, so uh, I am on page 21 still, and this is chapter two. Uh, now let us consider an employee who's, who loses their job. Thursday evening, on Friday morning, they consult the vacancies advertised in the local newspaper and online and apply for a suitable job. They also knock on the door of all local employers to, pre to present a CV and inquire about, about a job. Uh, within a week, they have secured a new job. Following their thorough job search, would it be correct to argue that if all the unemployed searches are searched as conscientiously for jobs, then the unemployment problem would be solved? The answer is no. To make the discussion simple, uh, assume all the unemployed are qualified to fill available job vacancies, but 100 workers are com competing for 50 jobs. At best, 50 of those job seekers will remain unemployed uh, irrespective of how thoroughly they search for her jobs. This topic is further discussed in the tale of 100 Dogs and 95 Bones, uh, Center of Full Employment and Equ uh, Equity. Uh, is on, I guess, uh, coffee, C-O-F, uh, couple F-E-E, uh, C-2001, okay, so anyway. <laughs> uh, a contemporary example of the flawed reasoning that followed a fallacy of composition in the is the paradox of thrift, which is that while on the individual, uh, while an individual can increase their savings if they are disciplined enough, a macro level fact, the same reasoning does not apply at the macro level. By reducing their individual consumption spending, a person can, of course, increase their proportion they save and enjoy higher future consumption of, uh, of possibilities as a cons consequence. The loss of spending to the overall economy caused by this individual's adjustments would be small and so there would be no uh, detrimental impacts on overall e economic activity, which is driven by aggregate spending. But imagine if all individuals, all consumers adopted the same goal at the same time and started to reduce their, uh, wait a minute, their spending in mass. Surely this would impact sales, enhance employment and in income at the aggregate level. It is not so clear that after all adjustments are made, we will find that aggregate savings had risen. This is what Keynesium called the paradox of thrift. Why does the paradox of thrift arise? In other words, there, what is the source of this compositional fallacy? The explanation lies in the basic uh, basic rule of macroeconomics, which, well, which you will learn once you start thinking in a macroeconomic way that spending creates income and output. This planned economic activity power uh, ac activity powers the generation of employment to produce the goods and services. Thus, adjustments in spending drive adjustment. Uh, adjustments in total production or output in the economy as firms reach to higher or lower sales for increasing in or reducing employment and output. As a consequence of increased saving, uh, total spending falls significantly and as you will learn from chapter 15, 
national income falls as production levels react to the lower spending and unemployment rises. The impact of lost consumption on aggregate demand spending would be such that the the economy could plunge into a recession. Certainly, uh, certainly, t- total savings will be less than individuals plan due to the fall in uh, equilibrium national income. As we will see later, if poor sales due to increased desire to save negatively impact on, on investment, aggregate sw- saving would certainly fall. By assuming that we could simply add add up add up the macroeconomic relations to the representatives uh, or representative firm or household, the mainstream economist consensus at the time assur- assumed that the aggregate unit faced uh, the same constraints as the individual subunits. During the global financial crisis or GFC, the conservative reaction. Uh, to increasing government deficits when it was to enact fiscal austerity measures by cutting government expenditure and or increasing taxes and to encourage uh, nas- nations to cut domestic costs in order to uh, stimulate their export sections via increased competitiveness. If one nation does this in isolation while all other nations are maintaining strong economic growth, this strategy might have a chance of working in a similar way once a individual saver, saver might reasonably assume that changing uh, their consumption choice would not cause a widened effect that would Im- impact their local or uh, their income. But if all but if all uh, nations engaged in austerity and cut their growth rates, then overall spending are declines and imports will fall across the board as well, or as will exports. This is another example of a fallacy of composition. It is the interdependence uh, between countries via trade as well as fall in net government spending that undermines the policy prescription. In this case, it is also clear that not all countries can rely on export-led Export the growth to more, uh, to more than offset a decline in net government spending, since for every exporter there must be an importer. MMT contains a coherent logic that will teach you to resist falling into into intuitive traps and com- uh, compositional fallacies. MMT teaches you to think uh, in a macroeconomic way. Keynes and others consider that, that fallacies of composition, such as the paradox of shift, provided a primo, prima, excuse me, <laughs> primo, uh, prima, uh, basic case for considering the study of macroeconomics as a separate discipline. The above example shows that we must be very careful when drawing general conclusions on the basis of our own experience. Now, 2.3, what should a macroeconomic theory be able to explain? Any macroeconomic theory should help us understand the real world and provide both explanations of historical events and a reasonable forecast as to what might happen as a consequence of set events. For example, changes in policy settings. A theory does, doesn't stand or fall on its absolute predictive occur, uh, accuracy because it is recognized that forecasting errors are a typical outcome of trying to make predictions about the unknown future. However, systematic forecast errors, that is, continually fa- failing to predict the direction of the economy and catastrophic kind of oversights for example, the failure to predict the 2008 GFC are indications that a macroeconomic theory is seriously deficient. In this section, we present some stylized facts about the way in which modern industrialized economies have performed over the last several decades. These facts will be referred to at, referred to throughout the textbooks and the realist, uh, reality check 
we when we compare different approaches to the important macroeconomic issues such as unemployment, inflation, interest rates, and government deficits. The facts provide a benchmark against which they which any macroeconomic theory can be assessed if a macroeconomic theory guarantees or I'm sorry generates excuse me, not guarantees but generates predictions which are consistently at odds with what we subsequently observe then we can conclude that it doesn't it doesn't advance our understanding of the real world it should be discarded the real GDP growth, real gross domestic product or GDP is the measure of actual production of goods and services in the economy over the course of a particular period. We will learn how the national statistics offices measure it and how we imp- interpret movements in real GDP in chapter four when we study the national income and per product accounts or NIPA, for now we consider economic growth to be measured by the percentage change in real GDP, and in that sense, it is one measure of the prosperity of a nation. We will learn that employment growth is also dependent on output growth, and it, and so a higher real GDP growth usually means higher un, uh, higher employment and lower unemployment. Table 2.1 shows the average annual real GDP growth rates by a decade from 1960 from various countries. The the sample of national chosen, wait, nations chosen includes three large industrialized European nations, representatives uh, representatives of the the North or German and South Italy and Spain, all of which are members of the Eurozone. A European nation outside the Eurozone has since its inception in 1999 in the UK, a small open econ- economy predominantly exporting primary com- uh, primary commodities and with a relatively under- underdeveloped industrial base, Australia, and two large non-European industrialized nations, Japan and the USA. Several things are clear. First, real economic growth has been lower on average since since 2010 than the 1960s for each country. Second, the Southern European nations, uh, Italy and Spain, have clearly performed poorly in the most recent period. Third, the European nations, while within the Eurozone, including Germany, have performed relatively poorly since 2000. Fourth, Australia has generally performed better than the other nations, which is in uh, Table 2.1, which I'll uh, be discussing right now. The average uh, annual real GDP growth by decades per percent, uh, Germany, which is between 1916 and 69, was 4.5. Italy was 5.7. Spain, 8.6. The UK, 3.1, Australia, 5.0, uh, Japan, 10.2, and the US, 4.7. From uh, 1970 through 79, Germany was 3.3, Italy was 4.0, Spain was 5.3, the UK, 2.6, Australia, 3.3, Japan, 5.2, and the US, uh, 3.2. Wait, actually, I think I messed that up. Australia was 3.3. Japan was 5.2. I'm not sure if I said 3.2 or what, but anyway, yeah, that was Japan, 5.2, and USA was 3.2. Anyway, so 80 to 89, 2.0 was Germany, 2.6 was Italy, 3.0 was Spain, 2.7 was UK, 3.4 was Australia. 4.4 4.4 was Japan and 3.1 was the USA. Uh, from 90 to 99, 2.2 was for Germany, uh, 1.5 was for Italy, uh, 3.0 was for Spain. Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, uh, wait a minute. I said 80 to 89. Okay, 2.0, 2.6 for Italy. I'm screwing this up. <laughs> okay, so 80 to 89 again. Uh, Germany is 2.0, uh, 
Uh, Italy was two point six, and you can you can fast forward as any time you want as far as that part goes. If you get confused, uh, three point zero Spain, two point seven UK, three point four Australia, four point four Japan, and three point one for USA. For 1990 through 99, 2.2 for Germany, 1.5 for Italy, 2.8 for Spain, 2.1 for UK, 3.2 for Australia, 1.5 for Japan, and 3.2 for USA. From 2000 to 2009, so very much the financial crash from the uh, late 2000s, 0 0.8 for Japan, uh, for Japan, excuse me, for Germany. Uh, 0 0.5 for Italy, 2.7 for Spain, 1.9 for UK, 3.2 for Australia, uh, 0 0.6 for Japan, and 1.8 for USA. In 20, uh, 2010 to 2015, 2.0 for Germany, minus uh, 0 0.5 for Italy, minus 0 0.3 for Spain, uh, 2.0 for UK, 2.6 for Australia, 1.4 for Japan, and 2.1 for USA. Now, it seems to me that Italy and Spain, as far as I, maybe it's because they're part of the Eurozone, I'm not sure. I I'm think I think they are, but anyway, whatever. Anyway, so, let's see. The, the, among the questions uh, that are, that, our macroeconomic approach needs to be able to answer is a consistent fashion are why has GDP growth on average slowed? Why is Australia's growth rate since 2000 superior to that of the other nations? Why have Italy and Spain endured a negative growth uh, in the period of 2010 to 2015? Unemployment. Uh, yeah, uh, unemployment. One of the stark facts about modern uh, economics, uh, economy, excuse me, has been the way in which uh, unemployment has evo evolved since the 1980s. While different nations have recorded different outcomes, the common thread is that unemployment ha uh, rates have risen overall and in most cases have been sustained at higher levels for many years. In figure 2.1, the unemployment rates are the percentage of willing workers who are unable to find work, are shown for the seven nations depicted in table 2.1 from 1960 to 2015. Please note that the vertical scales are different. Table 2.2 provides further information upon which to assess the historical behavior of unemployment. Figure 2.1 and Table 2.2 show that unemployment rose in all seven nations between or during the 1970s and persisted at the at these highest and at these high levels well into the first decade of the new century. Unemployment rate in Japan have uh, have been significantly below those of the other nations shown, although they have also trended upward. The data also show uh, quite clear cynical, or yes, yeah, uh, not cynical, uh, cyclical, I know, anyways, uh, yeah, no, cyclical uh, patterns. Uh, Australia, Australia being a clear pr pronounced example of this. Unemployment was below 2% for most of the early uh, post-Second World War period and then rose sharply in the mid-1970s, continuing to rise as the economy went into a deep recession in the early, in the early 1980s. E uh, economic growth in the second half of the 1980s brought Australia's unemployment down from its 1982 period, oh, sorry, not, I mean peak, but never to the low levels in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s. The 91 recession saw the unemployment rate jump up again very quickly and reach higher than the 1982 peak. The rate started to fall again as growth ensured, uh, ensured, ensued after the recession was officially over, but it took many years to get back to the pre-1991 levels. Now, in Table 2.1, as I explained earlier, uh, average unemployment rate by decade per cent in 60 to 69, Germany was uh, 08, uh, no, well, 0 0.8, 
Italy was 3.8, Spain was 2.5, UK was 1.8, Australia was 1.7, Japan was 1.3, and USA was 4.8. From 1779, and Germany's was 2.4, Italy was 4.7, uh, Spain was 4.4, UK was 3.6, uh, Australia was 3.9, Japan was 1.7, USA was 6.2. From 80 to 89, uh, Germany's unemployment was 6.8, Italy was 8.4, Spain was 17.5, UK was 9.6, Australia was 7.5, Japan was 2.5, oh, yeah, Australia was 7.5. Japan was 2.5, and USA was 7.3. From 90 to 90, from 99, from, 90, from 1990 to 99, 7.8 was Germany's. 10.4 was Italy. 19.5 was Spain. 8.0 was UK. 8.8 .8 was Australia. 3.0 was Japan, and 5.8 was USA. From 2000 to 2009, 8.9 Germany, 7.9 uh, Italy, 11.3 Spain, 5.4 UK, 5.5 Australia, 4.7 Japan, and 5.5 USA. From 2010 to 2017, 5.1 Germany, 10.9 Italy, Spain was 21.9, UK was 6.6. Australia was 5.6, Japan was 3.9, and USA was 6.8. Let's see, on the figures for 2.1 are on page 24. Uh, compar comparative unemployment rate per cent, uh, 1960 to 2017. It's basically just a visual of a uh, a statistical visual of what I just said in regards to uh, the statistics that I just told you. Uh, on page 25, uh, I'll be right back, in fact. Stay tuned. Hey, and welcome back to You Down with MMT, where I am quite literally talking or um, reading out the textbook of Modern Monetary Theory by L. Randall Ray, William R. Bill Mitchell, and now, who was the last one? <laughs> Something Watts. I apologize for not remembering the first name. Uh, oh, yeah, Martin Watts, excuse me. Anyway, so I'm back on Chapter 2. Uh, number 25, the U.S. follows a similar pattern, although a compa uh, compared to Australia, unemployment rates were higher in the early post-war period, but lower in the 1990s. The Great, the Great Financial Crisis, or GFC, largely bypassed Australia, but led to higher unemployment in the U.S., which has fallen somewhat uh, since. Unemployment rates uh, tend to behave in an uh, asymmet asymmetrical, uh, asymmetric, uh, symmetric, symmetric patterns. They raise uh, very sharply and quickly when the economy goes into a downturn in activity, but then only gradually fall over a long period once growth returns. And a, a, any credible macroeconomic model needs to provide convincing explanations for these movements. How was unemployment kept at low levels during the 1950s and 60s? Why did unemployment rates rise in the 1970s and persist at the level, or sorry, at the higher levels for several decades? What determines the cyclical and asymmetric pattern of the unemployment rates? Is there a behavioral relationship between GDP growth data shown in 2.1 uh, and the unemployment rate in two, uh, table 2.2? .2? In 
answer uh, in answer to the first question, two questions, MMT would refer to the key prop proposition in macroeconomics that total spending determines output and employment and indirectly unemployment. MMT would conclude that the problem probably lies in insufficient spending attributable to insuff insufficient aggregate demand, a topic we will pursue later in chapters. Real Wages and Productivity In 1957, the renowned British economist Nicholas Calder, I hope I got that right, wrote an article in the ec uh, Economic Journal about the nature of long-term economic growth. He noted that there were six remarkable historical consistencies <laughs> revealed uh, by a recent empirical investigation, which is on page 591, if you ever get this book. Uh, blah, 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 lost my place. Ah, there we go. Uh, which he later considered to consti constitute the stylist or you know, stylized uh, facts regarding economic growth. He noted that these constancies, uh, constancies were not necessarily immune to cyclical, cyclical variations as the economic cycle moves up and down, but were relatively constant over long periods. Among his stylized facts of economic growth was the observation that the share, and this is in quotes, the share of wages and the share of profits in the national income has shown a remarkable constancy, constancy, <laughs> there we go, in developed uh, capitalist economies of the United States and the United Kingdom since the second half of the 19th century. Uh, but yeah, uh, he has a uh, Calder, 1957, uh, 592 to 93. Uh, this observation was repeated by many economists for other nations uh, in terms of the distribution of national income between labor uh, wages and capital profits. Uh, just to let you just to let you know, I did tell you from the very beginning that some words may come not so not so well for me. Anyway, so let's see. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Okay, I mean, okay, yeah. Uh, we will learn in later chapters that for the sale of sh share of wages and the share of profits and national income to remain constant over time, real wages must grow at the same rate as labor pro productivity, which they haven't. Uh, real wages are the purchasing power equivalent of the wage workers a worker receives in, ma in money terms. Labor productivity is the output that is produced per unit of labor input. Figure 2.2 picks up the story in 1971 for Australia, for the Australian and the U.S. economies. These examples are representative of the trends observed over this, this time period in a number of advanced economies of the world. Up until the early 1980s, real wages continued to grow at the same rate as labor productivity uh, represented as the GDP or as GDP per hour worked uh, on our graph, which is consistent with the Calder's observation. In the early 1980s, a gap opened up between these two da data series and has widened ever since. Don't worry if you are having trouble interpreting the graph and its underlying data at this stage. As we work through the material in this textbook, we will develop the techniques necessary to assist you to interpret changes in data. In terms of shares of national income, the growing gap between the real wages and labor productivity has meant that there has been an ongoing redistribution of real income away from workers' wages towards capital or profits. How do we explain the increasing discrepancies in national income shares? Why did the period of Calder's stylized constancy of national income shares end? What are the implications of such a substantial redistribution of national income away from real wages, which have uh, until the last few decades been primarily dr driver, primary driver of the household consumption expenditure? 
what other factors now influence the growth in household and consumption expenditure. This is a topic that macroeconomics must be able to explain, and this textbook will help you to address these questions. Now on to page 26, private sector indebtedness. Uh, figure 2.3 shows the rise in household debt as share of disposable income between 2000 and 2015 for a range of OECD nations. Over the period shown, the ratio has risen remarkably. Uh, markets are now, I'm sorry, not remarkably, but markedly. Most in most nations, as financial market deregulation accelerated, uh, let's just say the Australian uh, one is up to about one hundred and what seventy five or so. Um, as far as percentages, and then the U.S. is up to about roughly one hundred and ninety seven percent. Or some to that effect. Uh, that's until 2011. And again, you'll have to get the book in order to be able to see what I'm referring to. Um, anyway, so let's see. Da, da, da. In, large, uh, in this large increase in household debt. Oh, that's a debt ratio. Excuse me. Um, in this large increase in the household debt ratio linked to the distribution shifts in national income implied by 2.2, uh, what other factors might explain this shift? What are the implications of the ele uh, elevation in the household uh, debt to disposable income ratio? Why do, was the GFC linked to this movement? Again, in this textbook will provide you with the under understanding you need to comprehend these issues. The central bank balance sheets, figure 2.4, Okay, there it goes. Now, two point four shows that so-called monetary base of the income or U.S. economy administered by the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, we will learn about the learn about the monetary base in la in later chapters. But for now, we can simple simply consider it to be the total reserves of the U.S. banking system held at the central bank or the Federal Reserve Bank, plus currency, notes, or coins in circulation. Monetary base represents liabilities on the balance sheet of the U.S. Central Bank. Uh, up until 2008, the monetary base predominantly comprised currency on issue. The proportion in bank reserves increased from 2008 so that in December 2015, bank reserves were around 60% 65% of the total uh, monetary base. In January 2008, the U.S. monetary base equal, equal, equaled uh, 830 uh, billion, 632 million. I hope I did got that right. Anyway, it is 830632. Just say, uh, and then uh, acceler accelerated upwards very quickly, and by 2015, it stood at uh, 3835 800 million. A uh, huge increase by any standard. The rise in bank reserves at the central bank is not isolated event, and similarly, and similar balance sheets uh, sheet shifts occurred uh, in recent years in other nations. For example, Japan and the UK. Uh, many main, mainstream economists predicted that the sub substantial rise in central bank reserves would flood each economy with money and cause inflation. Historically, tells uh, history tells us that over the same period, inflation has been low. How do we explain the massive shift in the balance sheet of the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank? What are the implications of this shift? How does the monetary base relate, uh, monetary base relate to the mon money supply? Can the central bank carry liabilities of the size indefinitely? On page 27, Japan's persistent fiscal uh, deficits, the glaring counterfactual case. Consult among uh, almost any other macroeconomics textbook, and you'll find the following proposition stated in some form or another as uh, inalienable fact. One, persistent fiscal deficits push up short interest rates because the, uh, the alleged need to finance higher deficits increase the 
increases the demand for scarce savings uh, related to its supply. Okay, so let's see. Uh, two, the these higher interest rates undermine private investments or investment spending. The so-called crowding out hypothesis. Three, persistent fiscal deficits lead to bond markets demanding increasing yields on government debt. Four, the rising public debt to GDP ratio associated with the persistent fiscal deficits will eventually lead uh, bond market to withdraw their lending to the government and the government will run out of money. Five, persistent fiscal deficits lead to accelerating inflation and per potentially hyperinflation, which is highly deter uh, detrimental uh, to the macroeconomic uh, ma ma macroeconomic economy. Japan was the second largest economy after its recon reconstruction or reconstructing following the Second World War led to the led to speculate speculate speculator spectacular excuse me Jesus spectacular growth in 1960s it is now the third largest economy behind the United States and China Japan in 1990 provided provides a very interesting case study for macroeconomic macroeconomic economic macroeconomist there we go because it has been marked by a number of macroeconomic outcomes that are at odds with orthodox thinking as we can see and okay well as i can see really um uh as we can see in figure uh 2.5 japan has run a persistent deficit since 92 a massive buildup of private ind indebtedness associated with the real estate boom accompanied the five years of fiscal surpluses from 87 to 91. The boom crashed spectacular, uh, spectacularly in, 99, in 91 and was followed by a period of low growth and the need for higher deficits. The convention in Japan is that the national government matches its fiscal deficit with the issuing uh, issue uh, issuance of bonds to the non-government sector, pr uh, principally the private domestic sector. Uh, the figure 2.6 shows the evaluation, uh, evolution, excuse me, of public debt levels as percentage of GDP since 1980. Gross public debt is the total outstanding public debt issued by Japan's national general government sector, but the government also has investments which deliver returns, and when we subtract them from the gross public debt, we get the net public debt. Unsurprisingly, given the institutional practice of assuming, issuing debt to the private bond markets uh, markets to match the fiscal deficit, the debt ratio has risen over time as a reflection of the ongoing deficits that the Japan Japanese government has been running to support growth in the economy and maintain relatively low unemployment rates. If the neoclassical propositions summarize above uh, currently oh, correctly capture the way the world world the real world operates then we should have expected to rise to see rise rising interest rates increasing bond yields and accelerating inflation in Japan given the, uh, the persistent fiscal deficits did the persistent fiscal deficits in Japan drive up interest rates and government bond yields? The answer is clearly not. Uh, the overnight interest rate in Japan, which is administered by the central bank, the, Japan, the Bank of Japan, this is the interest rate that banks use to borrow, it has stayed exceedingly low and has not responded adversely to the persistent fiscal deficits. Uh, see, long-term ten-year, yeah, long-term ten-year bond yields, interest rates on government debt has also stayed very low and not responded adversely to the persistent fiscal deficits. If investors consider the government debt uh, become increasingly risky to purchase, they would have demanded increasing yields to compensate for that risk. There is no such suggestion. That bond market investors have become wary of Japanese government bonds to be both to found that to be found here. 
nor have they signaled any unwillingness to purchase the debt. Demand for the bonds remains high and yields remain low. Uh, and figure 2.9 shows the inflation and deflation rates for Japan between 1980 and 2005 and 2015, excuse me. Inflation occurs when there is an ongoing increase in the general price level, whereas deflation describes the situation where or when the general price level is continuously falling or negative inflation. <clears throat> uh, as I can see, uh, and if you buy the book, you can see, uh, you can see that since the property boom crashed and the Japanese government began to run persistent and at times large fiscal deficits, the inflation rate has been low and often negative. There is clearly no inflationary bias in the modern Japan, uh, yeah, Japanese me, economy, as persistently predicted by the mainstream economic, economic theories. The above evidence shows that despite persistent deficits and rising public debt to GDP ratio, along with a bond market, uh, along, along with a bond downgrade of Japan credit rating by international ratings agency including Fitch uh, in 2015, international bond markets have not punished the Japanese uh, government with higher 10-year interest rates and on public debt, nor uh, has the central bank lost control of the overnight interest rate. Second, the persistent deficits have not led to higher rates or domestic inflation. It is clear that the mainstream economic, economic explanation of the relationship between fiscal deficits Interest rates, bond yields, and inflation rates is unable to adequately capture the real world dynamics in Japan. Such a such a categorical failure to provide an explanation suggests that the mainstream theory is seriously deficient. A MMT explanation of these empirical outcomes will provide uh, uh, will be provided in chapter twenty and twenty one. When a student, when students will have developed a thorough understanding of the workings of modern monetary economy, with the sovereign currency and the operation operation of fiscal policy. Uh, Two point four, and I, I've skipped a couple because a lot of times uh, it was more of a there was no actual number for me to read. It was just uh, graphs. So. And I don't really read graphs very well, so I decided to skip those, and then later on there was words wording with it. So anyway, so 2.4. Why is it so difficult to come to an agreement on policy? The minimum wage debate. In the previous section, we explored some of the stylized facts and noted that these are things that econ economic theory ought to be able to explain. In this section, we turn to an example of a policy debate, the minimum wage. Many countries have legislated minimum wages, wages that are periodically raised. Each time policymakers examine the case for raising the minimum wage, economists are paraded to predict the disastrous consequences for employment should uh, wages be raised. Excuse me. Uh, many of these economists dishonestly proclaim the economic theory reaches a decisive conclusion that minimum wages cause unemployment. In truth, economic theory gives at least two answers to the question of the effects of raising minimum wage and unemployment. Raising uh, wages increases business costs that develop uh, th that beyond some point will uh, well some point will increase the price of output. We, if we hold the income and purchasing power of consumers constant, it would seem that the higher prices must lead to fewer sales and hence to lower unemployment. Uh, to lower employment, there are other effects that could strengthen this impact, such as higher imports from abroad, where labor is cheaper, and also substitution of uh, machines for labor. Uh, whose prices, uh, whose price has gone up. Thus, neoliberals argue that raising the minimum wage must lead to higher unemployment. Uh, two, not so fast, says our two armed economists. 
if we if wages rise, then it's it is not necessarily true that consumer income enhanced purchasing power is constant. After all, most consumption is financed by wages and the incomes of those employed at the lowest wages have increased. Those workers buy more goods and services. Firms will which sell these goods and services might decide to hire more workers. Those workers buy more too. If some employers decide that at the higher minimum wage they prefer to buy robotic machines to replace workers, that means more jobs making machines. We cannot say for sure that the net result of complex chain reaction will be more jobs or fewer jobs. So any two armed economists will admit that economic theory cannot provide a decisive answer. The frustrating student and policymaker also, oh, I'm sorry, asked, but why can't we look at real world evidence to settle the question? Economists do, of course, try to do just that. And the tool of choice is economic, uh, uh, econometrics. Econometrics, okay. Uh, we look at a number of cases where uh, minimum wage uh, wages have been raised in the U.S., for example, the 50 U.S. states have their number of cases where minimum wage, oh wait, oh my bad, uh, have their own minimum wage laws, so it is possible to compare unemployment or employment effects in one state with when the minimum wage uh, is raised while it held constant in neighboring state with other, with otherwise small uh, similar conditions. What the most uh, careful stu studies in the U.S. find is that raising wages does not tend to reduce employment and raise unemployment. Indeed, it looks like the correlation goes the other way with employment rising. Does that settle the case? No. Even, uh, even leaving aside clearly ideological biased claims by opponents of minimum wage hikes. Such empirical studies cannot do uh, be decisive. Even the most careful design tests cannot control for all possible factors that might affect employment. We cannot be sure that raising wages was the, what uh, caused uh, uh, employment to rise. There were well, uh, they, there could be well be an uncontrolled factor that coincide, coincidentally increased employment, and indeed may have done so even if the wage hike by itself would have actually reduced the number of uh, number employed. Economists are well aware of this conundrum. Empirical correlation never proves causation. Causation itself is a deeply complex topic. While we can put together theory and models and data to make a case, you, we probably would not be able to prove that X causes Y when it comes to the most significant questions in economics. John Mayer Keynes argued that the best one can do is to convince, uh, convince by the way of one's argument. Certainly one needs theory and probably evidence, maybe even a mathematical model, but even that will not convince an opponent unless the case is made through persuasive argument. <coughs> Keynes was a master of argument, but even he did not always win. More recent, uh, Deirdre, or, yeah, De Deirdre uh, McCloskey made a similar claim in her book, The Rhetoric of economics in 1985, rather. Her point is that evidence alone is not decisive rhetoric. The art of discourse is also important. If proof is difficult and theory provides ambiguous answers, can economics mar uh, make progress? In the final section, we'll address this question. In 2.5, uh, the structure of scientific revolution. In his influential book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, Thomas Kuhn, 1970, advanced a thesis in which he distinguished between normal science that works within a paradigm and scientific revolution 
that breaks free of the paradigm or even smashes it apart. For our purposes, we can think of the neoclassical uh, approach as a paradigm that works within the framework of utility, maximization, and rationality with the Keynesian slash institutionalist slash Marxist approach as the paradigm breaking scientific revolution. Returning to the d database or debate, excuse me, about the minimum wage, the neoclassical conclusion that raising wages cause unemployment is the correct answer if one views the question from within neoclassical paradigm. And that paradigm prices ration uh, resources and at higher prices where prices there will be less demand. As wages rise, employers want fewer working workers. It makes sense to argue that unemployment rises. However, within the paradox paradigm, what matters is aggregate effect demand, a topic a topic to which we will turn we will turn later. Uh, higher wages mean more income and more sales. Hence, firms want more workers. The net effect of, of a wage hike could be more employment. Khan's uh, breakthrough was the realization that most of the time, scientists, including ec uh, economists, work within a paradigm asking and attempting to answer questions in a manner that is consistent with the paradigm he calls this normal science and research process mainly entails puzzle solving. The normal scientist comes across uh, anomalies that are hard to resolve within the paradigm in which they work, as we see in box 2.1. Or as I, as I see 2.1. Uh, let's see. Khan's argument, that, well, Khan's argument rather was that over time, as researchers pursue normal science working within their paradigm, they come up against more and more anomalies okay. that cannot be explained. Another example would be the flat earth theory. Early scientists uh, could come up with increasingly complicated explanations for the apparent anomalies. Okay, that's been, uh, for example, as ships approach shore, shore from a distance horizon, only the tops of the mass are the first visible due to the Earth's curvation and curvature. However, if light uh, travels in a curve and path, that phenomenal a phenomenon uh, could be explained within the, the flat Earth paradigm. Yet other tests should would find that light apparently uh, travels in a straight line, which is an anomaly. According to Kahn, as the anomalies build, some researchers begin to think outside the paradigm, well, perhaps the Earth is not flat. Guests and servers may not be rational on the narrow neoclassical sense. People begin to develop a new paradigm. Kahn calls this a scientific revolution and has been likened to taking of distorting glasses and putting on prescription lenses that correct vision. The world never looks the same uh, again because the new paradigm changes one's views completely. What were the thought to be anomalies are easily explained within a new paradigm. It is a coincidence that the new paradigm is developed by the, by younger researchers or by other or by, by those outside officialdom of the profession because it is easier for them to cast off the uh, old ideas. Within the new paradigm, normal science advances uh, by puzzle uh, solving uh, and eventually comes up against uh, new anomalies. Eventually, yet another scientific revolution will be needed. Note that no disparagement of normal science intended. Most of the advance of science comes through puzzle solving. Indeed, one cannot be cannot do research or even attempt to understand the world without a paradigm to start from. Start from. Start from. But puzzle solving by itself is not enough. Scientific revolutions are needed because paradigms are also constraining. They uh, constraining. They limit the conception of what is possible. 
when he has finished a draft of this classic work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Mo Money, uh, the 1930, in 1936, John Maynard Keynes wrote to a friend, George Bernard Shaw, proclaiming that his new book would revolutionize e uh, economic theory. If not at once, then at least eventually. This is quite a claim to make, of course, but Keynes was brilliant and confident. The immediate reaction to his book seemed to validate his expectation. While not everyone was able to jump aboard, it is not an exaggeration to say that many recognize the revolutionary nature of his theory. By 1960s, most macroeconomic uh, macro, macro economists considered themselves to be Keynesians or Keynesian. And yet, Keynesian theory soon fell out of favor. Mainstream macroeconomics began to shed macro, uh, Keynesian ideas from the early 1970s, and they were almost completely gone by 1990s. It would be as if it, as if we returned to the early theory about uh, theory after embracing round Earth theory. Note that part of the difference is that economists is uh, economics, excuse me, is a social science that studies human behavior and proposes policies that directly affect human lives. It concerns topics that are con conscientious and where policy be, uh, benefits some, but not but can hurt the interests of others. All the policies that come out of the Keynesian Revolution were opposed by some groups, whether it was social welfare for the poor, social security for the aged, aged or jobs for the unemployed. Opponents uh, inevitably regroup and attempt a counter-revolution. Social science also experiences uh, experience revo uh, reversals. Social theories from the past are thrust into the limelight again. Indeed, even the hard sciences Old ideas sometimes come back. In the USA, for example, the well-established uh, theory of evolution is again under attack. Kahn had warned that we should not uh, see science as steadily progressing in a linear fashion from myth to trust or truth. There is a tendency to write the textbooks in that manner, but, real but uh, reality is messy. In any event, the authors of these textbooks do view Keynes' general theory as a scientific revolution and Kahn's sense uh, as were Karl Marx's theory presented in his 1867 book, Capital. In both cases, uh, orthodoxy amounted uh, counter-revolutions to restore neoclassical thought. By 1870, three orthodox economists had published books to not only defend but to strengthen the arguments of neoclassical uh, economics against Marxist econ uh, economics. Jevons, uh, I should say Jevons, uh, Walrus, and she's Walras, maybe, and Menger published. And their uh, contributions between 1871 and 1873 in direct response to Marx Henry 2012. In other words, the neoclassical framework was developed as a rebuttal to the Marxian approach. Marxist uh, revolutionary theory carried on, but in much of the West, it was sidelined as the neoclassical theory beca became a dominant. In the case of general theory, the Keynesian revolution was uh, gradually aborted as a few of uh, Keynes' uh, ideas were inter uh, integrated into the neoclassical approach, forming the neoclassical synthesis, which was outlined in textbooks and textbooks uh, with Paul Samuelson in 1947 in the lead. All the revolutionary insights of Keynes and Veblen and Marx were dropped in order to make Keynes more or less consistent with neoclassical econ economics. Unlike the case of Marxist capital, which was openly disparaged, uh, Keynes' book had been celebrated. A few of Keynes' ideas were incorporated into the synthesis, and, mo and most macroeconomists uh, macro uh, became Keynesian, 
for some time, even though the full, a few full understood the book. Heterodox economists insist that this was a mistake, that neoclassical theory should have been dropped, and revolutionary insights of uh, heterodoxy stretching all the way back to Marx should have led to a new paradigm. While our main purpose in this book is to develop the coherent heterodox alternative, we will present the neoclassical approach as we go along. Students must be familiar with both alternatives. Conclusion. These examples demonstrate that macroeconomics is a highly con contested discipline in terms of theory and policy prescriptions. No prescription. When assessing the statements made by financial commentators and econ economists in the public debate, one must continually refer back to the stylist facts. It is important that student students gain familiarity with the language of macroeconomics and understand the key concepts of uh, theories which will be developed in the following chapters. <clears throat> now, the next chapter, uh, it would be the chapter two appendix, the Buckaroo's model. Uh, let's see, that would be an example. A modern monetary economy is characterized by a currency regime uh, whereby transactions between economists, uh, economic agents, for example, households, firms, financial institutions, and government can take place. This may involve, uh, the, for example, the purchase of goods and services by households from firms, the purchases of assets by households, and firms the, the payment of taxes to the government or the receipt of or you know, receipt uh, transfers, e.g. unemployment benefits from government. The real world buckaroos model demonstrates the the roles of the currency spending the taxes in a simplified economy. At the University of Missouri, uh, Kansas uh, City, students are required to undertake a specific specified. A uh, number of hours or community service, uh, as I mentioned earlier, during each year of this degree program, failure to complete the required hours of CES over the duration of the student's degree program has negative implications for the final grade that the student receives. The, ec the economics department ran the pilot program and designed the monetary system to administer the scheme, which, will, which we briefly outlined below. Each student is assumed to be project to be object to be subject to me to a community service tax of say twenty five hours work per semester payable to the to the university treasury. Assume there are the university uh, approved CES provides, for example, child care, aged care, environmental services, and so on. Who submit uh, who submit bids for student hours and to treasury. Treasury awards paper uh, notes, let's call them uh, bees as short for buckaroos, to the CES providers assuming uh, health, safety, and environmental standards are met in this eco uh, economy. Assume one hour of average community work is equal to B1. Paper notes are printed with the inscription that this note represents one hour of community service by a UMKC student. Uh, for example, Treasury may agree that students can do a total of 100 hours of work this semester at the XYZ not-for-profit agency, which provides support for elderly people who are living alone. Treasury provides XYZ with uh, B100, enabling 100 hours of student be, uh, labor to be purchased. CS providers then draw on their B, uh, Bs to pay students for their hours of service. This can be considered spending by the university treasury through the CES provider. If the student can, uh, student has undertaken 24, 25 hours of CES in the semester, then they can then, they can then pay their B25 tax. When they are when they return those B Bs to the university treasury, the transfer of Bs bite uh, bite excuse me, by each student. The Treasury extinguishes their tax liability for the semester. To be transparent, when I said B's, I almost put down BS. Anyway, uh, the University Treasury burns the B B's proceed from students or stockpiles them to be used for future Treasury spending, whichever is more cost efficient. 
The, the number of bees supplied to any CES provider is limited to the needs for this for student labor, but also its ability to attract student workers. Implications of the Buckaroo's model. Treasury is the only source of bees which cannot be a counterfeited. Treasury cannot collect bees taxes until it has spent some bees. Treasury can only be deemed to have spent when bees are handled, uh, handled, handed over to students for work done. Treasury Treasury cannot collect bee, more bees in um, payment of taxes than it has previously spent. A possible Treasury outcome is a balanced budget with tax revenues equally bees bees spending. Thus, bees were acquired by CS providers from Treasury are used to buy student labor and are then returned to Treasury as tax payments by the students. On the other hand, a surplus deficit uh, arises in, say, semester one, it to it total Treasury spending is less more less or more than the total taxation or taxes collected over that period. And that concludes Chapter 2. Uh, tomorrow in Chapter 3, a brief overview of economic history and the rise of capitalism. Join me for that tomorrow. Uh, I would say same same financial time, but who knows. Uh, thanks for listening. Again, please subscribe. Uh, support this channel with the subscribe, comment, uh, hit that notification button uh, or, you know, that bell anyway. Uh, hit OK and support more MMT uh, related material at realprogressive.org. Uh, also, again, look up uh, Warren Mosler and on um, uh, mosleneconomics.com. Uh, he has a, again, a must read or mandatory reading section on his website. Pretty much every book he's uh, produced. Uh, you can also look up uh, Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton, and L. Randall Ray has a book coming out as well. That one I'm not too sure about. But anyway, uh, once again, you've been listening to uh, You Down with MMT, reading from Macroeconomics by William or Bill Mitchell, L. Randall Ray, and Martin Watts. Thanks for listening, and you guys have a good night. Peace out for now. I'm William Pounds, Independent Green Party candidate for Arizona Governor, and I want to encourage everybody to volunteer with Voter Choice Arizona. I am a huge proponent of ranked choice voting because it completely eliminates the spoiler argument. Please click the link in the description to find out more. I'm William Pounds, Independent Green Party candidate. This guy is insane. This skull crusher dude. Ah, got him. Go crusher?